uh, it's my pleasure to you know, uh, introduce a great present uh, Dick Oliver uh, for <coughs> his talk. So uh, let me first introduce uh, Professor Jake Oliver. Uh, he is a professor and head of the Department of Statistics within the School of Mathematics and the Statistics at the uh, University uh, of New South Wales. Uh, he is also the Deputy Director of the Transport and Road Safety Research Center. He is an accredited statistician by the Statistical Society of Australia or past president of the NSW branch and the past chair of the biostatistical section. He serves on the editorial boards of BMG Open Plus One and the Journal of Road Safety. His research interests are in cycling and pedestrian safety, methods for evaluating public health interventions, and developing statistical methods for regression on the mean and population attributable fractions. Professor Oliver has informed the public health policy through expert testimony to state and federal governments, and he has provided his statistical expertise to the media on numerous occasions, including how unlikely it is to win the lottery. Uh, today, uh, <coughs> Professor Oliver will talk about bicycle safety. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, Huaxing. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Kavi and, and Dinesh for, for uh, organizing all this and inviting me to, to give a talk to you folks today. Um, I'll, I'll share my screen now. Okay, so, so I've been asked to talk about uh, bicycle safety and, and what do we know. Um, I, I, I've, I've, I've been to, I, I've tried to go to a few of these, but, but being in Australia, it's been, the timing is quite difficult for me. Um, but I, I wanted to start off by something that was maybe very obvious and maybe somebody has already talked about in one of these, one of these talks, but we, we are, in the middle of a pandemic, which is why we're having this talk uh, in this format, at least uh, partly. Um, and, and we've been in this situation for quite a while and, and there's not exactly an end in sight. Okay? And one of the things that it's done, it, it's relevant to this talk, is that many people no longer commute to work. Um, in Australia, uh, four point, an estimated 4.3 million Australians work from home now. Right. Maybe some would have worked earlier before that. I, I used to work a day or so or two a week before all this, but now this is every day. So I don't get in a motor vehicle very much. Um, if I do travel, it's more likely than not to be walking nearby or maybe cycling. Um, I, do get, I do drive a car a bit more, but a, a bit, um, but certainly less than I did before all this happened. And this has had a positive effect on, um, on road safety, in a sense. So this is uh, the, the Secretary uh, General of um, uh, IIT, I, get, I can always get it wrong, the, the OECD group, the ITF, I believe, um, post, post this to Twitter uh, yesterday. And it's a graph of, from, from their 2020 report that looks at the change in traffic uh, across the OECD countries and also the change in, in road deaths. Um, you can see here that uh, New Zealand looks fantastic in this, right? So New Zealand is 80% uh, uh, reduction in road deaths and a 74% reduction in traffic. Um, we are sort of around here. Now, uh, this is a comparison of April's from last year to, to this year, um, not looking at, say, the cumulative uh, amounts. Um, but, but, but there seems to be some, some positives that, that we can take from, from this. Um, but as the Secretary General uh, warns, it, um, is that the drops are not proportional to reductions in traffic. So up here, some usually well-performing countries um, have increased fatalities during, during this time. For both. It's really just from comparing two months, but, 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 but this looks really good down here and maybe not so much here. Uh, this is what what it looks like in Australia. Um, this is Australia-wide over here. The blue is the median 
uh, road fatalities per month across the previous five years, so sort of 2015 and 2019. And the red is the count for this year. And I have it by the different states and territories. I live in New South Wales and uh, Sydney in New South Wales and, and our road fatalities are quite a good bit lower this year than they were uh, last year and, and Victoria as well. Now Victoria and, and New South Wales have um, at various times have had harder lockdowns than other places in, in Australia, Victoria especially. And so um, um, things aren't fantastic in the middle of a pandemic, but, but there's certainly some positives I think we can take from this. Um, with one big exception, bicycle fatalities. So bicycle fatalities uh, looking at it in the same way. Now this is across all of Australia, um, whereas um, the road fatalities as a whole are down 9% or so, uh, bicycle fatalities are up 67% from, from the five year median from the past, uh, uh, um, um, uh, at least the cumulative, cumulative deaths of the past, uh, um, this year compared to the five year median. That's quite troubling. Um, it could very well be that we have more people cycling. Um, it could be that things aren't as as good this year as they as they have been uh, the past five years. It, it's really hard to say for us living in Australia because we 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 honestly don't collect very good data um, in all this. Okay. Now, one of the things that has happened in uh, uh, in in Australia and in lots of places around the world is because of the pandemic, there's been a big push to create what are called pop-up cycleways. And, and that there are more there there are because maybe there's restrictions on travel, um, people who may take public transportation aren't taking it anymore because of social distancing. And so, so some places, uh, many places I should say around the world are, are creating uh, these pop-up lanes. And you see it here, um, there are these uh, sort of temporary uh, uh, barriers that are being put into place. Um, this is from uh, Twitter, and this is actually a video. It's quite nice. This is a, a vehicle that um, goes along the road and just it, it, it lets it go and, and, and places it around there. So you can place the these barriers and um, on a stretch of road in a very very short amount of time. Now they, they're they're temporary, they, but 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 um, lots of places are thinking about that, trying to make them permanent. Um, there also been a big push to have car-free neighborhoods. Um, now that many people are working from home, they're spending a lot more time at their house and with their kids and, 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 and they're recognizing that we need to move away from having um, so many cars on our road, so much uh, motorized tra travel and, and protecting um, the streets for uh, vulnerable road users is, 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 is definitely catching um, uh, having a lot more interest, a lot, and has a lot more support for it than maybe there has been in the past. So I'd say, just before I get talk talking about uh, cycling safety, um, I'd just like to say that that the, the pandemic gives us a, a unique opportunity to to maybe um, change the way that we design and view the spaces we have in our cities, and that we would be more um, proactive in in having protected cycleways for cyclists and, and maybe better better ways of uh, traveling by walking uh, for pedestrians like you know, cr crossing a six-lane highway is, is not very fun um, although where I live in, in Sydney it tends to be okay to take my son to school I, I have to cross a six-lane highway um, and there's no protected bridge it's not a tunnel um, except for that part of the journey, it, it's quite nice, but there is still that part of the journey. Okay. Um, this is what it looks like in, in Sydney. Um, I was, wasn't really sure how well this would turn up. Um, uh, just as a, a point of reference, uh, up right here, that, that's under this logo, that's the Sydney Opera House. And this is the, the harbor and that's the, the, the bridge. Um, the red is the existing cycleways that we have, and the yellow are the pop-up cycleways that are um, have been introduced. Now, they, there there has been pushback from from motorists and and some others that are don't like having uh, maybe some parking taking up to, to to put these pop-up cycleways in. But but uh, given the, the the discussions that happened in the, just the previous session, I'd say it's quite clear that we need to do something in our cities and to, to get down, um, uh, to, to improve air quality, 
to, 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 to stop using um, uh, 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 devices, vehicles that, that, ex that, that expel greenhouse gases. We got all these environmental and, and other reasons to, to stop using cars. And, 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 and I think we should be trying to push back uh, against that. And, 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 and if we want people to cycle, we want people to use um, active transport modes, then we have to make things safer for them. All right. So here's an outline of, the, of my talk. I, um, because of the, 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 the proposed title for this talk, is I wanted to um, first uh, just do a bit of a search of my own, trying to see what, what kind of guidelines do various safety organizations around the world recommend for cycling. Um, so I first went to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US um, about what it recommends for cycling safety. They have a, a website designed uh, for that. Oops. And, and we have, um, they categorize them in two different ways. One is effective interventions and the other is what they call promising interventions. It labels bicycle helmets and bicycle helmet laws as being effective and promising as, as active lighting and rider visibility and roadway engineering measures. I'm quite perplexed a bit about, about this one. Um, many people in cycling safety around the world would argue that separated cycling infrastructure is what primarily what, what governments and others should be doing to try to improve cycling safety and, and also to try to make cycling attractive um, for cyclists. So I was a bit confused why the CDC um, sort of minimize in a sense what 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 is often seen as the as the main um uh intervention to make cycling safer uh nitsa ha have had these recommendations uh it says it helmets and then basically just to avoid crashes which quite frankly i, I don't find uh, very helpful um um in, in cycling says so just you get on a bike do what you can to avoid a crash it, it's not I, I find that to, to not be uh, very helpful um, sure, we want to avoid crashes, um, but but we we also need to have a system in place that helps us to, to do that, and, and not just put the burden solely on the person on on the bicycle. Um, um, there's also the World Health Organization, which I could not find a, a single landing page for for bicycle safety. Um, they, they they do promote uh, World Bicycle Day. There aren't many messages around cycling safety. Um, in that, uh, it, at least in their, 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 their materials that, that are available online, it essentially just says make cycling safe and that's about it. There are lots of nice pictures of cyclists, but, but, but that is about it. It does, in some documents, uh, recommend the use of uh, helmets for motor bicyclists and motorcyclists, um, but it does say things like we should, uh, I'm a bit paraphrasing, but it does say things we should all bike and walk more for our physical and mental health and the environment. Um, it is hard to walk or bike more because roads are made for cars. And the lack of separated bike lanes increase risk of injuries and deaths, which makes cycling less appealing. So separating uh, cyclists for motorized transport can, can help uh, uh, us avoid crashes, uh, cyclists avoid crashes, but it can also make it more appealing for those who may, you know, may, may be a bit initially scared off from cycling because they are worried about maybe being hit by a motor vehicle. Hi, Jake, I, I have a question. Okay, so here uh, you mentioned the guideline by the WTO. So uh, yeah. such as lack of separated bike lanes increase yeah. risk. So uh, in the first section you mentioned, so the COVID-19, and pandemic, uh, you know, increase uh, it seemingly uh, seemingly increases the number of uh, fatality of, of bicyclists in Australia, right? Yeah. Yes. So uh, then you mentioned uh, the pandemic uh, provides us an opportunity to think of a city, right? In design or other preparedness for road safety. Could you, you know? say something about, uh, you know, uh, first, how to understand the increase in, of bicyclist fatality during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. The second, so how to, you know, link this, the WTO guideline and other guideline to the 
CT, you know, preparedness during, uh, for road safety during pandemic like COVID-19 and other public health emergency? I think we don't, to be honest with you, we, we, I, we don't really know. Um, um, in Australia, we do a really good job of collecting fatality data. Um, and we, we, there's, we do a very good job collecting hospital data. But partly because of lack of resources, but also partly because of privacy issues, we often don't collect much better than that. Um, like we, we don't collect data on how often people cycle. We don't collect data on how much they might ride a bike. Um, and so the, the increase in the cycling fatalities um, in Australia during the pandemic is, is, is disturbing, I'd say, but it could very well be because there are lots more people cycling. It may not be, but, it, but it's hard to answer that question without, um, without having better data. I, I'd honestly say that one of, the, one of the, honestly the most difficult things about cycling safety here, and I think it's true lots of places, not, not just uh, it's an Australian issue, but we often don't collect very good relevant data. Like, so, so we collect very good data about what's happening on the road. Um, and unless a cyclist is, is, is hit by a motor vehicle, we may not know much at all about a crash. I'll talk about this later in my talk, but um, there, there is uh, some recognition now by, by several people that, there, that single cyclist crashes are a big issue. That it's a big issue that 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 that, that goes unnoticed. That most crashes occur um, with a cyclist by themselves. There are, you know, sometimes we don't know if, if maybe a, a motor vehicle played a part in that crash or not. But 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 when the things we often know more about with cycling and cycling like injury specifically is because they are, that data is being collected for other reasons. And that reasons may have more to do with motorized transport. And that, that collecting cycling data needs to be more geared just to cycling, which is, which is a different kind of data collection. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. It's a very, very good question. Um, okay, so the International Transport uh, Forum also doesn't have a single landing page, but a lot of what they they see they, they do is to to provide reports with with main statistics I think and and um, and, and what legislation exists in various places. Okay, but it does but they do encourage things like safer streets, uh, limiting motor vehicle speed, um, and addressing locations with no or continuous cycling infrastructures. One of the one of the difficult things that we have we have fairly. Uh, lots of places with bicycle specific infrastructure that separate cyclists from motor vehicles, um, but it's quite often not connected to a network. So we'll have a nice stretch of, stretch of, of cycleways where the cyclist is by themselves maybe or with other cyclists and it's very, very safe, but to get where they need to go to, they need to get onto some very busy road and mix with motorized traffic. All right, I want to talk a bit about, about cycling infrastructure. Um, um, the, why do we need cycling infrastructure? It, well, uh, it turns out, and maybe this is, this is obvious given the audience, but, but cyclists in a motor vehicle crash produce a substantial amount of kinetic energy that is inflicted on the cyclist body. And so they're more likely to be injured. This is a paper, the first cycling paper that I ever worked on. Uh, where we looked at different kinds of crashes. So we have cyclists in an in injured uh, with a motor vehicle, a cyclist who's injured with a pedestrian, and a pedestrian injured with a cyclist. Okay. Um, this, the, the motivation behind uh, this study, this is one plot from the study, but the motivation behind this was, was try to get a sense about where should we put cyclists. Um, because we're often, um, even 10 years ago, and, and we have in this problem now, is as we often don't have the space to have se separate places for motor vehicles and for cyclists and for pedestrians. And so should cyclists share spaces with motor vehicles? Should they share spaces with pedestrians? Okay, and, and this is the, this one here, Th this is the uh, rates of, of hospitalizations for cyclists um, involved in a motor vehicle crash. It is by far a much higher rate than any of the other crashes. Um, except when you get down to the older age groups, okay? But it, it's sort of, 
give, give some give, give, give some support that that we are, in some sense we should be prioritizing cyclists to 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 get these rates down. Okay, um, and it and it sort of also says is that if we put cyclists around with pedestrians, um, things tend to not be too bad, with a, a big exception around here. Okay, and that is and that is when the pedestrians are older. And they're older and they're frailer, and we probably shouldn't have cyclist sharing spaces with uh, pedestrians. Um, not because the because um, necessarily there they'd be more crashes, uh, more inter, uh, conflicts. But if a pedestrian gets knocked over at that age, they they may not recover from. It. Okay, or the injuries can be quite bad. So so we need to so 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 the. Basic idea, I suppose, is that is that um, if there is excessive or differential speed, the likely contributing factors for injurious motor vehicle and cyclist crashes. Um, and uh, I give an example about, about what I mean by the next couple of slides. Um, and but I'd say we we there are the Romberg curves, but 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 there isn't an awful lot of data to support where the curve should be. If if we have speed we can definitely show um, using uh, basic statistics that, that that the curve would give that sinusoidal shape okay but there is a, a an issue i think with with where should it be like and it's just important because it sort of tells us where the cut point should be and, and then maybe give us some ideas about what speed limits should be and also um you know definitely what maybe what the travel speed for a vehicle should be and what the thresholds are for where if there is some sort of uh, crash, um, 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 what what be what would be considered survivable? Okay, in a sense. So we don't. I'd say I would argue with cyclists. We don't really know what that is exactly. Besides that, there is this sort of shape. We do know a lot more about pedestrians. Um, this is a, a paper I published with a, a, with a few students, Kinat Hussein and Han Ching. Thing uh, along with uh, Rafael Giver and Tom Briss, and this is a systematic review and meta analysis of studies looking at impact speed and pedestrian fatality or injury. So we have fatalities, uh, AIS three plus and AIS two plus injuries. Okay, and and we can see that at around thirty kilometers an hour, the probability of of any of these happening is about five percent. Okay, and that gives us some support then that maybe we should have speed limits that are around 30 kilometers an hour. And especially when pedestrians are around and maybe if you go higher than that, then, then it needs to be areas where there isn't poor visibility or other, other okay? And this is and this is a data from 36,000 or more than 36,000 pedestrians. There's a lot of information that, that, that that's played into estimating the, these specific curves, okay? For cyclists, this is the only curve that I know about. Um, this was published uh, earlier this year about something that wasn't necessarily about impact speed and cyclists. Uh, this comes from the German in death accident study, um, which as I'm sure a lot of people know is a very uh, detailed data set uh, out, of, out of Germany. Um, and we can see that the curves are quite different than for pedestrians, right? Um, so the, the fatality curve is much lower at, 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 at higher speeds. So it's not even 5% until we're getting at 50 or so. Yeah, I, I would, uh, David Davies asked a question about, about um, would we, should we focus on fatal or more severe life changing uh, and not worry too much about slight casualties? Um, yes, I, I, I would, I think I, I combine the, the serious and the fatals together, and we often don't think about the serious ones, I'd say. Um, we, we, we think about fatals more than anything, I think, and, and part of that is, I think, is because, is that if there's a fatal injury, spend a lot of resources trying to work out why that happened. Um, we don't spend a lot of effort and resources trying to figure out the injuries that happen at the lower speeds, and, and to be honest, for us to get accurate estimates down here, we also need to have lots of audits, which are very time consuming um, um, and, and resource intensive where there wasn't a fatality or an injury. We need to have that good controls. Because if, if we wanted, because the, these are just effectively come from estimates of proportions of events, right? And so 
down here, if it's if it is like say one percent, that means we'd have to we should be auditing like a hundred um, crashes where ninety nine of them didn't result in an injury. And trying to convince people that we need to do that to get accurate estimates down here, because that down here is where we want to know where where the some some reasonable threshold is so that we can set speed limits and, 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 and have a good idea about what the tolerance is. Okay. And, and without that, like we, we know, sorry, we know, we know that if, if somebody gets hit at, by a motor vehicle traveling hundred kilometers an hour, their chances of having something seriously bad to them are really high, right? We know a lot about this. We know, but we need to know what's down here so that we can accurately estimate this. Okay? And that, that, that's very, uh, subtle, I think, um, and maybe not always clear that, that th this is what we need to know more about. I mean, we have here that th this model is estimating at zero kilometers an hour impact speed, a 10% chance of an AS2 plus injury, okay? Now this is quite possibly a cyclist from standing still just falling, and that's it. Um, I think. So can we have a question? Could you uh, see the, you know? The, yeah, sorry, I, I, I can see it. I'm just, I'm still trying to get to the first one, I think. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so, uh, bicycles are, are on two wheels. There is some sense of inherent um, uh, imbalance and, 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 and difficulty in, in keeping it upright, right? It's um, same in a sense with motorcycles. Um, uh, Kavi has a question about, uh, I'd maybe call it issues around micro mobility, I suppose, which include electric scooters and some other things that have been popping up more and more in, in cities. Um, I, I'd say we don't really know an awful lot about it. I and mean, one of the, one of the very difficult things to, to say is that we often rely on hospital data that uses ICD code, or international classification of disease codes. What is an ICD code? For a scooter, electric scooter injury, right? And, and, and we often rely on these various existing coding schemes um, that are definitely never going to keep up with these new things, right? That may be several years from now, but 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 then so we don't I'd say we don't really know. I mean, we can do very resource intensive uh, studies from uh, within an emergency department. So, like when someone presents with injuries, we, we give them a, a a battery of survey questions and asking lots and lots of things, but we're certainly not going to go into our hospital records and, and be able to gather that because there is no coding for these things. Like, what do we do about quad bikes as well? Like quad bikes, I don't think are in ICD codes either. Uh, maybe ICD 11, but nobody's using that yet, right? Um, um, so yeah, I think it's it's a growing problem. I thought someone was going to ask about uh, issues around microbiology, and I'd say I don't I don't fully know what the answers are. I mean, um, I was in Berlin last year, coming out of uh, a, the the underground, and just about got wiped out by uh, an electric scooter. Um, um, I didn't get hit, thankfully. Um, I don't like the idea of electric scooters being on the road because they're not really a motor vehicle. They've got zero protection at all, you know, and how often, you know, they don't have things that um, we would often have on motor vehicles or let's say, I say motor vehicle, but, but we have on vehicles that would be on a road like reflectors or lights or other things, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's, these are challenges that I think we, we need to be thinking of now and, and should, if, if, if people have been thinking about it, they should have been thinking about them years ago, I think. Is that this is coming and this is this is kind of happening. I, some people argue that micro mobility is what people are going to start should be using so that we get cars out of city. Um, so because because some people what people like is that is that having something not having to use your own power to travel distances is one of the the, the one of the draws of having motorized transport. If you have an electric uh, bicycle or electric scooter, that certainly increases the radius you can travel, right? And it's less damaging to the environment and other things um, to have an electric scooter or or an electric bicycle, right? <clears throat>
<clears throat> yeah, so it depends on what you, uh, this is David Davies. This is about uh, the serious injuries to cyclists. It sort of depends on what you define as serious. Um, the AIS scale, um, I, I, I look, I, I, I would argue if, if you have a two, AS2 injury, it can, depending on what it is, it can be quite serious. So like so certain um, skull fractures and intracranial hemorrhage are AIS2 injuries, and those wouldn't usually be considered serious. But, the, but, but having a skull fracture is certainly no, no fun, right? It may be down there because the probability of death is, is as bad as, as other more serious skull fractures. Um, but it, it, I'd, say, I'd say the AIS in combination with where it's happening on your body is going to be problematic. And, and that, it isn't just a flat three or higher is what's really serious. Okay. And anything really to the head is, is going to be problematic. Um, unless it's really just superficial. Okay, uh, well, I want uh, back to the slides. Um, I, I'd like to, just just a, a point. As far as I'm aware, and I'm happy if, to be wrong about this, um, but uh, as far as I'm aware, this is the only curves that I'm aware of for cyclists being hit by motor vehicle uh, risk curves for that that that, that exists. That, uh, I guess I'd be very happy to be wrong about that. Um, but because of that, it, this is partly why there's a lot of variability here as well. We had many more studies. So in the previous slide, I had data from 20 studies. If we had data from 20 studies here, this curve might be very different. Okay. It's also in Germany, and not all of us live in Germany. Um, that, that it, it's great that, 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 they, that, that the authors of this study did this. Uh, it's not, not a negative against them at all. Um, Somebody submitted something and I got deleted, or maybe I'm looking at something the wrong way. Okay. All right. Um, so, and, and, and lead up to doing this, I, I asked several of my friends around the world to send me some pictures because I, you know, I haven't been traveling, not like any of us been traveling, and so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd try to, I try to make this a bit more international than just Australian, Sydney specific. So, so I, I got some colleagues to send me some pictures of, of, of places uh, cycling elsewhere. This is the Netherlands, where cycling infrastructure is usually very excellent. They put a lot of effort into trying to, to, to make cyclists, uh, put some, take cyclists away from motorized travel. Um, they have things you might call super highway, cycling super highways, and, and things like that. So we got the, got the uh, road over here, a place for for cars to park and the cyclists are here and over on the other side is where the pedestrians are. And I think in this lo location, they're going in both directions. So there's, there's cyclists going from in this direction on this side of the road. And I don't see it here, but there would be some other route where the cyclists would be essentially heading in the other direction. But, but physical separation isn't always possible. Um, I was in, in, in The Hague last year and there was a, a, a really well-traveled road um, with lots of parked cars, lots of buses, lots of other cars traveling. There were no cycleways at all. And it, it wasn't, it was, it, let's say it was worse than this one. So you see the little cyclist here. Um, there is no cycleway, at least not, not, not heading in that direction. Okay, so it's, it, it's, it's, it's great when we can do it, but it's not always possible. Um, uh, one of the big reasons, besides the obvious ones and other pictures, is that is that without physical separation, we may not have places for kids to cycle. Um, so this is near where I live in Sydney. Um, uh, there's a road here. It's not a very well-traveled road, but there are lots of cars here, and I would never want my child to cycle. On it. But there is a nice cycleway right here that um, a kid can use and and for other things. Okay. And so we don't have that. We, we may not be getting kids to cycle and without it, um, that might be a major deterrent from getting kids to cycle. Um, this is a, 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 um, from uh, Helsinki. Um, there have many, many bits of transport uh, uh, being, 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 being seen here. We've got cyclists who are here. 
got pedestrians who are here. There's a crosswalk for both pedestrians and cyclists here, but you'll notice we also have motor vehicles parked over here. It's in a sense very nice that it's out of the way, but this intersection would have lots and lots of conflicts in it at various times of the day, right? So the pedestrians have to maybe cross the cycleway to, to, to cross the street and both cyclists and pedestrians need to cross the street. So although things are reasonably separated for various users, there are places where there will be conflicts. And that's often, even when you have the nicest of, of infrastructure where problems can, can happen. Um, uh, this is, this is a, a place at, not too far from our campus in, in Sydney. This is uh, Sufian Bufos, the director of our Transport and Road Safety uh, Research Center. Um, here we have uh, uh, intersections that are designed specifically for cyclists in, in mind. You don't see it from the full picture, but there are several lanes of tra tra uh, motorized tra travel um, from here that, that Sufjan would have to cross to cross the street, but we have a stoplight for, for cyclists and also for pedestrians. Um, this turns into a cycleway going around that way. Here are buses that are that motorized, that, that private vehicles not allowed on. There's another street over on the other side where they go. Um, but site, this pathway here, cyclists and pedestrians do share it, okay? I'd also say one of the things that I, I like that City of Sydney did, uh, has done over the years, is we have spe um, cyclist-specific directional uh, markings, okay? So this, uh, if you ever get lost in Sydney riding a bike, uh, look for these signs. It'll, it'll tell you where to go. Um, so we, we don't have just rely on the, on the signs for the motorists. Um, this is what it looks like in Peshawar, Pakistan. Um, uh, Manzoor is a recent PhD graduate student of, my, uh, student of mine, um, finished uh, earlier this year. Um, this is a road that's used for everybody and everybody and everything. Um, there's a motorcyclist and, and a rider here, uh, a bicyclist, uh, pedestrians and motorized vehicles, everyone using the same, the same road. There is no separation at all. Um, certainly when there's this much all happening in sort of the same confluence, uh, we, we, we should be having speeds that are lower than what they maybe usually would be because of, the, because of this. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we, we can't have separation um, and, and this, all, this is a common thing that's done in Australia and definitely in, in Sydney. Uh, this, although this is, in, this is in Helsinki, is to paint a bicycle lane onto the road. Okay, so there's no separate, there's no separation, uh, physical separation at all. But there is a demarcation between where the cyclist goes and where the motorized travel transport goes. And sometimes, definitely in in, in Australia, is is uh, what well, we would we, we, our, our travel would be the other direction, right? But, but going, but riding on the right hand side of the road, we would maybe also have uh, parked cars next to the bike lane. So we have, we'd have on one side, moving vehicles on the other side, parked cars, where the parked cars could door a cyclist and, and, and create really big problems. Now, um, and so the, 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 there is the chance with painted on lanes of being a, a, quite a bit of conflict um, because there is no real separation. There, there, is the, there is the sense that the cyclist knows where they should be and the motorist knows where they should be, but it gives a false sense about, with, uh, 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 it gives a false sense of real separation and that is problematic. Okay, and I'll, I'll talk about a study um, uh, 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 the next slide. Okay. Now, what some people ought sometimes do um, instead of having these lines, which is not a bad idea, is to put things to to create separation. So they these things called armadillos, which are just little bitty uh, rounded kind of uh, things that go. They look kind of like armadillos, I guess. Go on lines and put planters or bollards to to make that separation. The pop up cycle lanes that we have are kind of like. Is that we there's a kind of already something like this, and they put something to, to have separation. Okay, this, so this is a study I worked on with uh, Ben Beck and uh, Marilyn Johnson. 
um, published last year, where we looked at uh, motorized vehicles going this direction. So we, we drive on the left in Australia. Uh, this is uh, a, a row of parked cars and the cyclist goes in the middle, okay? And what this, we're interested in the study is, is, is whether there is a, um, a painted on lane, yes or no, whether there's a parked car, yes or no, does the cyclist get more or less passing distance from motor vehicles, okay? And what we found is the worst scenario is when the, there's a painted on lane and parked cars, when there are um, no parked cars, and when there's no painted on lanes, cyclists got the most passing distance on average uh, across those scenarios. And so uh, one way to think about, uh, one made possible interpretation of this is that having a cycle lane gives the motorist a target. They, they think, well, if I, as long as I don't cross the painted on lane, the cyclist is safe, which, which is, uh, as someone who rides a bike and, and has, has been passed very closely before, it is very, very scary for the cyclist to, to pass very close. And so th th there's this false sense that the cyclist is safe just because there's a painted on lane. Some, a lot of people would argue in cycling communities that painted on lanes is not a cycle, it's not infrastructure. And maybe we should stop using it. Um, here's a, an example um, of something that happened uh, several years ago now that uh, Rafael Gipietta and his colleague um, George Recknitz uh, investigated. Um, this is a bridge across the Iron Cove, which is a, an inlet of the Sydney Harbour. Um, down these stairs is, is, is a lot of uh, walkways kind of go along the Iron Cove, along the harbour. It's very pretty down there. So you have lots of pedestrians and lots of cyclists and other things. And what happened is a cyclist was coming down this way where these uh, uh, police officers are now and a pedestrian was walking up the stairs. The pedestrian came up, the cyclist hit the pedestrian, pushed the pedestrian into the car, into the road and the, the pedestrian was hit by a car. And in doing so, the pedestrian suffered serious permanent head injury. Okay. So it kind of raises, it should raise the question about, well, what should we do in these spaces where, well, we, we've taken the cyclists away from motorized travel, but we've maybe created another problem. Okay. And so uh, in their investigation, one of the things they found, so this is the, the stairs to walk up to the road. So there are some signs here that are obscured by uh, plants, um, and they're also very, very high. So you see, this is George here, I think. Um, the signs are far higher than, than him as he's walking, as a pedestrian's walking up, especially stairs maybe that steep, you're looking down and not up. And so you don't even notice it, okay? Now coming from the other direction, this is what the cyclist sees. Um, it's a blind entrance. So we can see George here because he's wearing a yellow vest and he's specifically there for that purpose. Right, um, but the it wasn't as though the cyclist could see what was happening anyway until it was too late. So the pedestrian isn't wasn't prepared, the cyclist wasn't prepared, and there was the system there wasn't forgiving in case some interaction did happen. Okay. This is what that 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 looks like now. Um, this is from. Google Maps, which I don't know how new it is, but this is this is what it what I, I could I vouch for. This is what it looks like now. So the 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 this railway extends a bit farther, so the pedestrian can't just zip on out around the around the the, the post here. <clears throat> and there's marking on the road, telling everyone to slow down because there's pedestrians around. Instead of the instead of the signs being up above where it's hard to see, they're they're clearly written down down here. You also notice that there's a railway here that wasn't that didn't exist before. And it goes all the way down. So even not that it happened this time, but this, that there could have been issues where a cyclist fell into the road, and maybe that can that this can be avoided now because there the the, the that bit of bit of road has been redesigned in a sense to, to 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 try to make things safer for both cyclists and pedestrians.
All right, so the big question I think is, uh, they're given lots of examples. Uh, hold on, um, somebody's asking a question. Uh, can we draw similar requirements like demarcated lanes and clear distance for motor bikes also where the presence of the traffic is more than 40% of that traffic stream? Yeah, I know it depends on where you're at. Uh, 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 certainly in some countries, like 80% of people ride motorbikes, right? And depending on where you are, the motorbikes go all kind of over, all over the place. We can have painted on demarcation, but is that really going to stop anything? Is that really going to, it, it sort of depends on where you are, right? And, and certainly the, um, what would it uh, I think with a motorbike, it somewhat depends. Um, so the bicycle lanes are fairly narrow, really. They're not, they're not a full lane, right? They're, they're, they're fairly narrow, whereas a motorcycle can take the full lane. Although, it, you know, it's hard maybe in, in riding a motorcycle, it can be very scary if you try to take the full lane. Um, but, 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 but a motorcycle could actually take... Uh, can't see my hands, but but it's but we have a really wide, um, a lot more space, right? So there's demarcation, but the demarcation for a motorcycle would be the full length. Uh, maybe someone correct me if I'm I'm wrong. Um, but that that, that 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 could be similar problems. It could be similar problems. So it sometimes happens with motorcycles is maybe you'll have two riding in a lane together, and there one is kind of you know near near the edge of the lane, and a motor vehicle will just say, "Well, as long as I'm in my lane, that motorcyclist is safe." And that's all, especially for anyone on a two-wheel vehicle, motorcycle or bicycle, or even a scooter. Like that that that, that is a wrong. Um, I'd say that, that that's very wrong for a motorist to think that. A lot of things, bad things could happen and you need to give, it needs to be buffered there so that in case something does go wrong, um, the bicyclist or the motorcyclist's life is not at risk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, so I think uh, given some examples of infrastructure and some, some at least anecdotal arguments as to, as to, as to uh, why the audit of that of that intersection with the at the bridge and pedestrian and some other things should be done. But a big question is: is does cycling infrastructure reduce injuries? Uh, someone did a Cochrane review um, a few years ago now, and they found what turned out to be a lack of supportive evidence. Now, I'd like to give lots of caveats about this. Um, it's it's it, I think it's a, a situation where trying to design studies to demonstrate that bicycle infrastructure is beneficial is incredibly difficult because we don't have or readily have controls like we we could have say infrastructure being um, installed in one location and we have another location that's used as a control but those using two different locations isn't necessarily a good control. Um, you can maybe match them based on traffic flow and some other things, um, but it becomes very, very difficult to do that. Once infrastructure, cycle infrastructure is put in, you in some ways irrevocably, uh, I'd say, have a bad connotation to that, but 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 have have a have a um, um, that location is in some sense very different now than it was before. You can have before and after studies. Um, but then some people would argue you don't have a control then. And so places like the Cochrane, li uh, Cochrane Library would frown on things like that. Um, my, my, my own view is, 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 that, is that you should be choosing controls or having controls the best as you possibly can. Um, it is, it's not going to be possible to have a randomized control trial with cycling infrastructure, for example. Um, there are lots of kind of situations where we can't. Okay, but the, the, the authors do recommend uh, lower speeds when they are um, uh, uh, various people about. And the also, authors are also very cautious to say it it would be inappropriate and premature to imply that cycling infrastructure should not be installed. Okay, and so although we, we as, a, as a body of evidence, um, there, isn't, uh, there isn't much supportive evidence for cycling infrastructure, um, 
I, I would argue it's more a lack of um, quality of studies and lack of and lack of good studies, not a lack really of underlying evidence. Maybe maybe it, it's it's hard to see right now, um, but but it, but it's not. Um, um, yeah, it, I I I. I um, just think about that. Um, be, being a statistician, we, we like numbers and, and analyses and things like that. Um, and, and when things don't, uh, we don't have good quality information, um, I'd say we often just say that, well, we just don't know. Um, and I think that's kind of in a some way true about cycling infrastructure, although there are lots of examples where we could, where we could demonstrate that it has been beneficial. Okay. So lack of evidence doesn't mean lack of there being an underlying um, good reason to do it or good reason to build it. Okay. Um, we also have problems where um, we need to be smarter with the infrastructure we have. So here is, I cannot remember where I found this. Uh, it might have problems on Twitter somewhere. Uh, but here, this is definitely in Australia. We had a nice wide bicycle lane. It's painted on, but it's nice and wide. And the government had, has made it clear they want motorists to give cyclists space, but in doing so, they take away all the cyclist space. And this happens all the time for cyclists. We get uh, trying to ride in a cycleway, cars will pull out and stop in the middle of the cycleway, pedestrians will walk in the cycleway. And it, it would, yeah, we need to be a bit smarter with how we use them. All right, now I want to talk uh, about single bicycle crashes. Um, uh, hi, Dick. I, I have uh, some questions. So you mentioned a lot of infrastructure for bicycle cycling, uh, so such as space and um, passing distance and, uh, you know, sense and uh, also, you know, uh, bike lane are occupied by, you know, by parked uh, motor vehicle by pedestrian by motorcyclist so uh, how should we you know you, you know improve the use of cycling infrastructure should we take any actions to you know to promote the use of <laughs> cycling infrastructure um, I think there are, I mean, although I guess that's one of the things I found um, um, difficult um, about the guidelines when I was looking, bicycle safety guidelines I was looking around, is I, I would have thought that various organizations would be, would have, would be strongly promoting it, uh, but they weren't. I, I, it's not clear to me why they, they're not, but, 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 but they aren't. Um, um, in, in Australia, we spend very little money on on cycling. Um, I thought about having it in my in, in my talk, but it's something like uh, Sydney or maybe Australia generally spends about ten dollars per person on cycling infrastructure, where London spends like fifty. Um, part of it isn't just about um, attitudes or. Um, the, the the will to do it, but but some of it has to do with just not being having the will to fund it properly. Um, cycling infrastructure isn't free. It's certainly cheaper than than building a road for motor vehicles. Um, and but then people then have to prioritize cycling safety more so than having park parking or or, or other things. Um, I, I think I think it, I I believe at some sometime hopefully in the near future, uh, those who design cities and build infrastructures within cities will 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 realize that that there are far more benefits to to prioritizing cycling than not, and I think we're not at that stage yet in lots of places. That's not true everywhere. There are lots of places that prioritize prioritize cycling more than anything else, or or at least to a substantial amount, but that's not true everywhere. I'm not, I'm not really sure what the answers are there. Um, okay, thank I, you. Go ahead, please. I think, I think it has to happen. I think I just want to say I think it has to happen. I think it has to happen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, although 
as a cyclist, I, I, I feel this way when I'm on a bike. Um, I'm always afraid of, 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 of motor vehicles and that, especially coming from behind when maybe I can't see somebody. And, and there's lots of evidence that would say that in a motor vehicle crash with a cyclist, more often than not, it's the motorist who's at fault, okay? However, it turns out that most crashes don't involve a motor vehicle. So when it when a be just be clear when a motor vehicle is involved, it tends to be the fault of the motorist. Okay, but most crashes on on a bike are not um, do not involve a motor vehicle at all. Um, so here is uh, at hospital data on Australia. There's about 14% of Australian hospitalized cases involved a motor vehicle. There, there was another 14% that was unspecified, and I put that there just because without knowing about it, I. I didn't, you don't know how many of those are motor vehicles or not, but the remaining are either single vehicle crashes, so the cyclist by themselves, or they had a crash with either a cyclist, a pedestrian, or an animal. But the animal part just comes from, that's how ICD-10 is, is, is worded. Um, I guess it could be a kangaroo, um, but, um, it, 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 but, 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 but that, that's how things are coded in, in our hospital records, okay? Um, motor vehicle crashes may have more kinetic energy, and so maybe more injurious crashes and maybe more serious injuries coming from those crashes. But single cyclist crashes are certainly more common, and, and I think we often ignore them. Um, and and some, I think we, we need to have some emphasis on that. Um, so uh, this is a study I did with, with Sufjan Bufos several years ago now. This is a cycling fatalities in Australia. Whereas since 91, um, uh, fatalities had been kind of been decreasing, um, not by a lot, but had been decreasing. And but we, we investigated in terms of multi-vehicle crashes and single vehicle crashes, we see quite a very different uh, pattern. Um, um, yes, uh, Kavi, uh, says that uh, in most cities in the U.S., bicycling is a fairly dangerous activity because there's little safety infrastructure to support safe cycling. Yeah, that, in Chicago, there's a there, there is there is a fair bit. Um, I was there about four years ago for a stats conference, um, but there are lots of um, there, there, there's a lot of. Uh, depending on the city, I suppose. Uh, Davis, California, has lots of infrastructure. Um, New Orleans, where I'm from, in the city at least, there's a fair bit of infrastructure. Um, you ask about safety in numbers. I am not a believer in safety in numbers. I, I think it's an overly simplistic view of what makes things safe and on, on roads and for other users. Uh, the, I'm calling uh, Jason Thompson from University of Melbourne, who has done some research on this specifically, and he he would argue, I think, I don't know, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he would argue that that that, that it's safety and density is is what can be associated with um, with safety, and that if you have a very dense amount of cyclists, say, then you can then then you may get that effect, okay. But at some point, without having enough density, even though you might have lots of cyclists, or by some measure, or a large increase in cyclists. Um, without having a, a, a large density of cyclists, it's not going to be safe because the, the arguments are then that you, know, that you see cyclists all, all the time, all around. Um, it causes motorists to, to look out for them because they know they're around and things like that. But that doesn't really happen unless you get um, you know, a critical mass, if you want to think about it, of some cyclists. It's not just numbers. It, it, it's, it, it, I, I, I like the safety and density. Um, uh, phrase it much more so, and it, it makes a lot more sense to me. Okay. But uh, Jason Thompson, I've looked out for that. He's, he's done some really good work on that. Okay, so the trends in cycling fatalities in Australia are quite different for for cyclists in, in involved in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a crash that involved another vehicle. Now, the other vehicle, by the way, could be another cyclist because the way that our, 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 um, our um, uh, data is presented, okay? But down, the, the single vehicle one is, is, is the cyclist by themselves. And so over quite a long period of time, there's been a, a large increase in those proportionally. I mean, the, the numbers are maybe not 
um, at least up to 2013, wasn't incredibly high, but they had definitely been increasing. But the multi-vehicle ones have been coming down quite sharply, right? Which is very nice. Um, and it also, I, I think, it, I think I, I, I would, I, I tend to interpret that as there, is, there has been some, uh, maybe not, maybe not enough, but there has definitely been some focus on, 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 on cycling safety and trying to get motorized vehicles or cyclists away from motorized vehicles. And in doing so, um, there's less conflict with them, and so maybe less uh, serious crashes, and, and then maybe less fatality. Okay. Now, one of the things I've mentioned this before, one of the things that we, we are sorely missing in Australia is, is we don't have comprehensive exposure data. So we don't know whether this is uh, because of more, you know, we have more cycling happening at this time or less cycling or anything like that. Now, I do know from 2001 to 2010, based on some surveys that were collected, that there is there was a lot more cyclists or people saying they, 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 they ride bikes in that time, but, but not in terms of the amount of cycling or anything like that, or how often they're cycling, really. So it could be argued that this pattern is due to just not knowing what cycling amounts are happening. However, there's this study um, uh, out of the Netherlands that has the same pattern. And they do have comprehensive exposure data for cycling. Um, so these are not counts of, of, of fatalities. These are fatalities per billion kilometers traveled. And the way their data is organized is we have uh, with the motor vehicle, so a crash with the motor vehicle, and then a crash without a motor vehicle. Okay, so it's not exactly the same definitions as it is in Australia, but roughly, kind of roughly the same. Okay, and we see exactly the same pattern. So we see that the, with the motor vehicle, things are going down. They, they the Netherlands puts a major focus on separate from motorized travel, and it's, it's appearing to have, appears to have had a really positive effect on things. Okay, but the single vehicle ones, or the ones with well, ones without motor vehicle involvement, have been increasing. And 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 um, I don't know what they are now, but we were worried around this time that eventually um, the ones without a motor vehicle would, would outnumber the ones with a vehicle. Okay, and, and, and the problem here is that, is that if you, we in a sense know how to remove, uh, uh, to, 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 to minimize or remove the, the crashes with motor vehicles, just simply removing the, the conflict between them, between cyclists and motor vehicles, okay? But what do we do about the single vehicle ones? It's not, it's not really clear, right? Um, um, there, there may be some arguments that some of those may have involved a motor vehicle in some way. We'd have to do audits of each of those just to get a sense about it, but, but, but certainly not all of them are, are, are involved, involve another vehicle. Okay? And it's not just a clear, well, we change the infrastructure, we separate them from, from whatever. It's, it's not clear. Okay. Uh, this is a study I did with Ben Beck um, and others at uh, Monash. Um, and it was an all, it was an in-depth investigation of single bicycle crashes in, in Melbourne, but just basic categories given for the different reasons why why the crash uh, was involved. So loss of control. There's an interaction with the tram track. Uh, Melbourne has lots of trams, and, and and getting your bike your tire stuck in a tram could definitely easily cause a crash, um, and, and other things. And about twenty percent of them involved a, a motor vehicle in some way. So. Um, about half of their crash data had were of on road crashes was a single big, single bicycle crash, and about twenty percent of those um, so was was involved. So so roughly speaking, of all on road crashes, about forty percent do not involve another do not involve a motor vehicle at all. Okay, that's quite a lot, especially if the you know, main safety focus is on. Um, minimizing the, the interaction between cyclists and motor vehicles. Okay. All right, this is just a bit of a plug. Um, so I think uh, it's it's one o'clock my time and this starts about three hours from now. So if anybody thinks they, they, they their, their interest has peaked a bit on single bicycle crashes, um, there's a free webinar um, at about three hours from now. Okay, and it's just, 
it's part of the International Cycling Safety Conference, which was canceled this year, but they, they does a, there was a meant to be a session on this and, and they continuing on with the session. All right. <clears throat> uh, now I'm gonna talk about uh, personal protective equipment and, and uh, with, um, Kavi asked, could, could the rise in single vehicle bicycle fatalities be because of an increase in bicycling among older people? Uh, certainly, it could also be due to an increase in e-bikes amongst older people too. So they are going faster than they, maybe their bodies can maybe sustain if they do have a crack. Um, I think the Netherlands is a bit worried about that too. I think that the, their their fatalities tend to skew to much older people. Um, it could be that they are a combination of it could be an e-bike. It could also be that they are too frail to 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 deal with uh, the forces on their body. I do not. I have a hard time with that. I don't know if we should discourage older people from riding bikes. It's it's a bit of a I think it's a very tricky one, right? Um, um, you know, it's like um, issues around dementia. If you, if you stop uh, doing things that challenge your brain, you may have have, have men mental uh, deficiencies as you get older. Um, we don't want older people to stop being active. I mean, maybe if, if they are too frail to ride a bike, they should do something else. But, but we, I think we also have to be careful about, about discouraging um, um, activity, right? We want people to, to be active, but, but safely active. <clears throat> okay, um, personal protective equipment. Uh, the main one for, for cycling tends to be bicycle helmets. There's been lots of biomechanical studies uh, uh, around, around some people of our uh, initial helmets used to investigate uh, uh, dummy test uh, uh, looking at, um, sorry, uh, linear acceleration. A lot of people have criticized that over time and, and several people, uh, Andrew McIntosh, Helena Stixon, and I think the folks at TRL and other places have at least eight years ago, maybe, or, or so, started investigating angular acceleration and trying to see if, if helmets, at a minimum, do they exacerbate injury or, or, or can they, um, are they actually protective? It turned out that they didn't increase uh, angular acceleration, um, but it definitely doesn't. That's, it doesn't necessarily help. But now we have new, newer technology, including uh, MIPS helmets. There's also Wave Cell, and some others, which is meant to deal with uh, absorb the the, the the angular acceleration, so that that maybe there's less chance of of brain injury. And then there's also uh, helmet wearing rate ratings that are helmet ratings that, that have come about. Uh, this is the Virginia Tech website that has a list of, of, of those for the US based um, 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 uh, standard for, for bike helmets. Uh, this, this link, this, this YouTube video here is, is uh, Helena and, and uh, speaking in Swedish about, about which, um, which helmets are, are best in, um, um, in, in Europe. Um, it, it is also has English subtitles if, if, you, if you're worried about it, but it's all it's very good. Um, the, the reason for 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 these ratings, just like what they are for motor vehicles and other things, is that it's, it's a way to, to get the manufacturers to improve the product, to make it to make things safer. Okay? Um, a, a lot of these MIPS and wave cell helmets tend to be five star helmets. Um, and and the ones that aren't rated very well, well. That, that can affect uh, the, the bottom line for a manufacturer, right? So the manufacturers want to not just aim for the standard, which is maybe the lowest level of, of possible um, effectiveness for a helmet, but, but to strive for much, much better. Okay. And, and, and hopefully that, that that's having, I don't know if it, not, I don't think anybody's done any analysis on that yet, but, but it'd be, I, I, I'd, I'd be surprised if it didn't positively in, in influence the quality of, of, of helmets and head protection that we might have. I have not have anything on here, but the Hofting, if you know what about that, that's, that's the airbag helmet that goes if, if you have a crash. Um, that tends to work out very well in biomechanical studies. Uh, this is a, a systematic review and meta-analysis that I did uh, a few years ago now, um, where we looked at uh, 
bike helmets and, and risk of various kinds of injuries. So we have a uh, head injury of any severity, serious head injury, which is roughly speaking um, an intracranial hemorrhage and or a skull fracture, um, a, a fatality where the head was a injury to the head was seen as a cause of, of death, uh, facial injuries and uh, neck injuries. And off to the left here, these are where studies suggest helmets are protective and over the right, these are, are harmful, okay? As you can see, ignoring the neck injury ones, um, virtually all, all the studies for head, face and, head and face are over here. Um, and including the serious head injury, the reduction is about a 70% reduction in, in the odds of a, of a serious head injury for those wearing a helmet versus not. Uh, the ones over here tend to be small studies, which you know might have about 100, 100 people. Whereas the studies, especially the ones way over here, these would have thousands of observations. The, these, these dots don't do the analysis full justice, but, 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 but the, 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 the effects of wearing a helmet on, very, on these kinds of injuries are, are quite profound. Now, bike helmets are not designed to, to do anything with neck injuries, but there has been arguments over time that, that say that, that, that helmets exacerbate neck injuries. And so some, stu some studies have been conducted to try to investigate that. Um, it's roughly speaking a null effect, okay? A as kind of expected from biomechanical evidence is, or, 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 or at least the hy hypothetically from biomechanical thinking. Um, and, and if, there's no, if there is no effect, by the way, we would expect some studies to be below it and some studies to be above it, okay? And they would just average out to no effect. So having some over here isn't unexpected for a null effect. Okay. <clears throat> now, what some people often argue is that, is that um, there's a selection bias um, with bike helmet studies because we often rely on, on, on cyclists who've already had a crash and, and it's been an injurious crash. And, 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 and so we, we, we don't get a full sense about what it's like for all cyclists. Because there, there's an argument that says, if I go out on my bike today, if I put it on, is it going to make me safer, generally? Not whether it's a crash or not, but it just generally. Okay, and try to get a sense of that a few years ago in, in this study where we, we took um, hospital data and computed odds ratios for helmet effectiveness from, um, uh, from, from data from a few studies. These are quite old studies, but, but, but there isn't, but there, there, there aren't. Uh, try to explain, but the, 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 there are um, there isn't much helpful data for newer studies to try to get a sense of this. So what 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 existed around the time of these studies is also estimates of helmet wearing. So that gives us an idea within the cycling population what proportion wear helmets and which ones don't. And from that, we can use the cases that exist in hospital data to to compute a relative risk. And this relative risk is for the population of cyclists, not just those in a crash. Okay, and that gives us then a sense about, well, if I knew what, what things were like in, this, in the full cycling population, not just those who go to hospital because they've had a crash, does it change our estimates? Does it change our view of how effective bike helmets are? It turns out it does very little of anything. Is that, that knowing what the cycling, what's happening in the cycling population doesn't really change our estimates. They're, they're roughly the same. So, kind of says that using hospital data is pretty good. It, it doesn't, it, it, it isn't problematic as some people might speculate. Okay. Now, um, this is um, uh, another thing that we could possibly do to, to try to make uh, cycling safer, uh, safer through, uh, uh, in some sense, personal protective equipment. Um, this is a randomized controlled trial um, out, of, out of Denmark that looked at cyclists who wore a yellow uh, vest or not and, and, and followed a, quite a lot of, lot of people over a fair amount of time. And they found that those who wore them had 47% fewer multi-party injurious crashes and 57% uh, had fewer multi-party crashes with a motor vehicle. Now, clearly, they, we, the idea is is the we want the cyclists to wear um, or to be to be visible so that motorists and others can see them, and so there isn't a problem with 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 uh, having a crash, and the crash can probably be avoided. 
Now the, there was a 2006 Cochrane review, like again with the, the, the infrastructure stuff, but that found no studies. They tried to do a review, couldn't find any studies that really looked into this. And so th this is, that was in 2006. This study came out two years ago. And it's the, as far as I'm aware, unless someone's done one recently, this is the only randomized control trial on this. And they, they found, they found um, yellow vest to be quite help helpful. Okay, now one last personal protective equipment uh, thing, um, and this is primarily for those of us, which I guess might be me given the time of day, uh, but is, is primarily for those of us in Australia, and it's because of magpies. Um, magpies are these birds in Australia that will that attack cyclists. So they're, um, they're very aggressive. I think they, they are trying to protect their, their nest. Um, and so this is, you'll see here, um, this is a radio uh, presenter, I believe, in Australia. And she was doing this um, specifically, you know, for, you, for YouTube for their show, just to see, um, can they do something to, to deter magpies from attacking? This is, like, in the video, if you, I've got the links here. If you watch the video, there's about, this magpie attacks her about 10 times. Like, this isn't just a one-off thing. Um, what she did is she painted on eyeballs on the back of the helmet, thinking that, you know, trying to do science um, to try to see if it could deter the magpie from, from attacking her. It did nothing. It just went after it. And a few weeks ago, or maybe about a month ago, there was a viral video of uh, this kid riding down a hill and a magpie attacking. So you see the magpie and the kid is scared out of his mind. Um, um, in Australia, I guess that it's kind of a saying, I suppose, that, that like every, anything can kill you in Australia. Yeah, riding a bike, one of the things we worry about most here are magpies. <laughs> we do worry about cars get, getting hit by cars, but, but magpies are pretty bad. All right, now I'm gonna talk about uh, cycling legislation um, as my last topic today. Um, there have been two systematic reviews of bicycle helmet laws. Uh, one was in about 12 years ago, and then another, the other one was two years ago. This is a forced plot from the more recent one. And, and, and both reviews have found that helmet laws increase helmet wearing substantially, and they are associated with reductions in head injuries. And, and the Hoya study uh, found the reduction to be about 20% for head injuries of any severity and about 55% for a serious head injury, which is quite a substantial reduction. Okay. Um, uh, the year after that, we published this study looking at fatalities in Australia before and after helmet laws came in. Now there were um, eight helmet laws because we have six states and two big-ish territories. Um, and they all came in starting from mid-1990 to mid-1992. Okay, so there, there's a period that's before legislation and there's a period after legislation. And this reduction is about a 40 or 6% reduction. And if you accumulate uh, that, the, the expected um, number of fatalities, if this trend had continued with, the, with what actually happened, there's about 1,300 cycling fatalities that did not happen because of helmet legislation in Australia. Okay. Now, this study came out uh, uh, the, earlier this year, um, which I find to be very fascinating. Um, it's a study that, that looked at whether people believed a helmet law, a helmet wearing was mandatory. For various countries. So uh, um, a lot of these are in Europe. This is part of a, a bigger study on, on, bike, hel uh, on bike helmets. Um, and so uh, up here, this is Norway. And I think down here is the Netherlands. But you can see that if, if a person thought their country had a helmet law, then they wore a helmet at a higher rate. Okay. Now, over here, um, about in Norway, based on this study, about 80% of people wear, of cyclists wear helmets. 
uh, most of the time, I think is what it's based on. Um, and um, they have no helmet law. I don't, they, I think they probably, I think they do promote it to an extent, but, but they don't have a law at all. Um, but quite a lot of people believe there's a law. And so it kind of raised the question a bit. Um, do you really, I don't say do you really need a law, but, but it, it, to say that, that believing there is a law is more important than, than, than in a sense, the law itself. Because once people buy into what they feel is, is, is an important thing for them to do, and so they, they adopt it, basically. Now, someone says uh, helmet wearing law, how much does it drop some bike usage? I, I did a systematic review for uh, the, the Swedish Transport Administration a, few, uh, a couple of years ago. I, I'm happy to, 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 to send you to the link in the report. Um, we didn't really find evidence that helmet, uh, sorry, that, that bicycle usage dropped after helmet laws. There are lots of places where, uh, not related to the helmet law at all, where there were maybe increases in cycling, and, and lots of places there was no evidence of any change at all. Um, there's about uh, a lot of the studies, this is, I'd say this, this, that topic is, is for a much bigger talk, to be honest. Um, um, there have been, there's something like uh, 30 countries around the world with helmet laws. And uh, there isn't much data for most of them. Um, but the ones that do have data, there isn't much evidence of reductions in cycling. Um, there was, in Australia specifically, there were stratified random sampling surveys in Western Australia and South Australia before and after helmet laws that asked people how often do they cycle? And it, the responses were maybe like the last week, the last month, the last six months or things like that and, and represented as proportions. And the proportions for the surveys before the law and after the law were almost identical. Um, but I, I, I said, I'm happy, I'm happy to point you to the report if you, if you want, but it's a much more complex topic than, than, than we have time for, I think. <coughs> Okay. All right, um, in, in Australia, one of the things that we've done in addition to, to bike helmet laws is to have um, what are called minimum passing distance laws. So cyclists are on the road with motorized traffic. traffic. It's legislation that, 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 that dictates how close a cyclist, can, a motorist can be to a cyclist. And, and the Amy Gillett Foundation in Australia is, is the main proponent of that. Um, Amy Gillett was a professional cyclist who, while training, I think in maybe Germany, it was, was hit by a car and died um, fatally. Um, it was very tragically, uh, very, very, very sad. Um, but a foundation was started in her name and they very focused on, on, on improving cycling safety in Australia. Um, they started out by, by having educational an educational campaign and it, it did virtually nothing. Um, I talked, I, I chatted with this a bit with uh, Marilyn Johnson, who's, who's part of the Amy Gillett Foundation and also at Monash University. And uh, I want to get her view before I gave the song. And her, she's very adamant that education was not enough. It was not enough at all. And so they pushed for legislation and it took a very long time to get legislation um, passed. So this is what the map looked like in Australia, maybe around 2016. This was uh, 2000, maybe this is 2016, and this is 2018. Um, and you see that, that the, the country over time is getting more and more maroon. This was earlier this year. Um, everywhere except for Victoria uh, has ado had adopted minimum passing laws. So that means that a motorist can't pass within a meter of a cyclist if this posted speed is 60 kilometers an hour or lower, it's a meter and a half if it's above, posted speeds above 60 kilometers an hour. Um, last month, uh, the whole country adopted it. So now the, the, all across Australia, there is minimum passing distance laws. Um, and and, and that there have been some assessments of these laws and they're, they're ongoing. Now that down here, there, there's this review that was published 
that does talk a bit about um, passing distance laws as part of it, but it's a it's a review on lateral passing distance more generally. Um, but it's a it's a reasonably good good article as well. Okay, if you if you're interested in it, some the the results I would say the scientific results are mixed with regards to passing distance laws in terms of whether it it gets motorists to give cyclists more more passing distance. However, um, at a minimum, I would argue that it legitimizes the cyclist uh, position as as being as having the right to be on a road and a, and a right to their own safety. And so whether or not it forces um, motorists to obey the law, um, that is in some ways a bit of a, not a completely separate issue, but a bit of a separate issue. I think the success of the law, it's something that should be the law no matter what. It's made my own personal opinion. Um, I think part of it, I, I, I definitely do not agree with the with the with the helmet being a magnet for motor vehicles. Uh, I published studies about that um, where I reanalyzed uh, someone else's data, and I don't you don't really see that relationship hold up um, on a reanalysis. And I know the main author of that article disagrees with me, but I. There are many, many other important things that influence um, passing distance, and they tend to deal with constraints on physical space. So if it's a very densely packed road, um, you're going to get less space as a cyclist. If the motor vehicle is very big, you're going to get less space. If you're far out into the lane, in the middle of the lane, um, you're also going to get less space. So it's not about this subconscious thing that's happening that some people try to promote. It's, it's, it's really about a lack of physical space. And that a motor vehicle, because they're going to, they, they're bound and determined to pass you no matter what, will ignore that they don't have enough space to pass you. Okay. All right. Um, we also have this is maybe a, a, a very Australian specific issue. And that is around presumed liability. Uh, there's a lot of places in Europe that that do this as a default. So um, what it, in a sense, what it what that affects us in Australia is that if a if a motorist hits a cyclist in Australia, the, the cyclist has to has to take it to the motorist insurance company, um, has to go through a massive amount of runaround to try to get anything out of it. So, like if a motorist runs over a cyclist, ruins their bike, they have to take it up with the motorist insurance company. And then they have to find and demonstrate that they were not at fault, that it was the motorist that's at fault. Um, this is presumed liability in that in that it 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 it, it assumes the fault is the motorist in those situations by default, and it's up to the motorist to demonstrate the contrary. So it's not that it doesn't free cyclists up from blame, but but it 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 it, it, it makes the process of dealing with claims and other things much more. It puts the onus in a sense on on, on the motorist. So the cyclist does really does something they shouldn't have done, and they really are at fault. They, they won't get away with it, but but um, there are problems there. There are also problems with um, with uh, recognition that 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 a cyclist has a right to be on a road, has a right to do their own safety, and, and other things around that. Darrell uh, Harworth, with some colleagues, kind of looked at issues kind of around that earlier or last year sometime, where they found that about uh, out of non-cyclists, about half of them do not see cyclists as being human, but they are in some ways less than it, 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 When it came out, it angered lots and lots of people and for good reason, but, but there is this kind of problem that cyclists face where motorists don't really see them as being legitimate in a sense. Okay. Now, uh, I just want to finish off a bit with just to recap some things that I've talked about. Um, I, I would like to say that, that, that I really stand behind this. I think, I think that we, we can take some positive out of, out, of, out, of, out of having a pandemic and having maybe less people travel by motor vehicle and that we can maybe make things, um, put a, sorry, put a, a, a focus on active transport in our cities and, and sort of use this um, time as, as an impetus to do that. And, 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 you know, it, it's in some sense easier for us to change now 
than it is before. Like we, how often would we have um, conferences over the internet like we do now, kind of seemingly regularly? Um, people have always fought that, right? Now that we're kind of forced to do it, it's kind of come become the normal in a way. And I think I think we 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 need to have a, re, a renewed focus on active transport in our cities. I'd also say that in my in my very limited review, I think safety organizations should be updating what they're doing. And 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 and, and you know we, we look to the World Health Organization for for information regularly. We look to the CDC. We look to all these organizations. They're meant to be the highest, in some sense, highest level of of information for, for things, right? Um, certainly crash avoidance strategies like separating cyclists from, from motorized transport should be the norm, but it's not always possible. And maybe we should have lower speeds where we can't. Um, I think there should be a, a big focus on single bicycle crashes and why they occur and what can we do to, to try to avoid them. Um, and although some people don't like the idea of having to wear a helmet and maybe high vis uh, equipment and, and other things, um, and some people get these arguments around um, um, victim blaming and things like that, I'd say that we, we, we definitely cannot stop all bicycle crashes. Um, and and I, don't, I don't just mean the motor vehicle ones. I mean, there's all these single bicycle crashes that are occurring that don't involve motor vehicles at all. Um, to me, I find that to be the most in some sense, the most disturbing because it's not so clear what to do with it. And, and, and unless we can avoid all crashes, then I, that we do have to work. We'd have to rely on personal protective equipment to, to protect us, especially our, our most vulnerable body parts. Right, yeah. um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, several people, uh, uh, colleagues. I mentioned them throughout the throughout the talk, um, but uh, the names are given there, and um, I'm happy to take any more questions if anyone has it. Um, by the way, this is my son cycling to school for the first time. I was a very proud dad that day. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Jake, uh, for a great presentation. Hakevi, uh, Hakevi, uh, could we extend, you know, the discussion for a few minutes or should we, you know, now is uh, 7.32, okay? Gojin, maybe five, six minutes is okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hi, Jake. So uh, your presentation provides a lot of information. So I, I have some questions. So you mentioned a lot of, you know, interventions or recommended uh, strategies such as improve, to improve uh, infrastructure and the legislation and the helmet use and also other interventions. So, at the same time, I, no, I also noticed that uh, these strategy or interventions uh, are seldomly used in low and middle income countries. So due to a lot of you know, reasons, do you have any suggestion you know, to improve the use of such strategy in such countries? Um. I, look, I, I I don't know. I think to me, I think it it it, it plays in a, at least a bit to um, 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 I think it plays a bit into the belief that 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 things are going to work. And I, I know that this is maybe a bit of bit of a bit of a, a different topic, but um, um, I remember reading several years ago a paper I reviewed about um, it might have been in Jordan or somewhere else in the Middle East where um, road safety is not often encouraged or really a, a focus at all and 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 the general feeling is that it's because of what people call fatalism and that and that uh, if you if you get hurt you do you die in a road crash well that's just God's will. And we and we have to change minds a bit as to the importance of uh, that, that these are things that are potentially avoidable, and that we can maybe do something about it. And unless we, unless people believe that, um, we may not ever get people to adopt road safety strategies. Um, 
it, it's a tricky one. I mean, I, I was, I had a postdoc from Thailand many years ago now. He wanted to get a sense about, about why, although they have a motorcycle helmet law, why don't people wear them? And in the capital in Bangkok, they, they wear them at a very, very high rate. But if you get outside of Bangkok, it's, it diminishes dramatically. And they, they have a law, uh, the United Nations, maybe 10 years ago or more, or maybe 12 years ago, had a, put a lot of effort in to try to uh, promote motorcycle helmet wearing and try to get the helmet wearing up. And it did virtually nothing. Yeah, uh, I, I, okay, so thank you. So, uh, here is the uh, question. Uh, have you read it? So, uh, in the box, so do you notice that the cars, uh, trucks aren't uh, giving enough passing distance to bikers who are wearing helmets? It's a difference in passing distance between the bikers who are using helmets and who not. I think, uh, hold on, I, 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 I'm, I, I feel like I answered that question earlier, am I wrong? I, 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 Dinesh actually uh, disagrees with me on something, and I, and I think I agree with Dinesh on this. Um, he says, this is about the, I said something about fatalism, and he, he said, he said he thinks it's a way of coping, and I think he's right about that. You know, we, um, we, 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 we often, I don't want to be like really nitpicky about, about certain people, but um, and when you get into science, you know, like people we think about quite often, especially in the hard sciences, is you get people don't like to um, have faith, I suppose, or, or believe in, in things. Um, there are definitely different sets, sets of beliefs. Um, and, and people find solace in things like that, right? And, and that, is, that is helpful for our mental health. And, and, and by, and by, you know, try in some ways accepting that there's a, a higher power that is maybe the reason why maybe bad things happen to us is a way of coping, right? Yeah, it's been, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good point. Okay, so uh, I have another comment. So, uh, as for you know, bicycle uh, safety in China, especially in uh, cities, uh, big cities in China. So the electronic bikes has, you know, evolved from uh, traditional e and, uh, shared bikes and to electronic shared bikes. So that means the shared bikes, uh, its speed, uh, you know, re is raised, you know, substantially, but lower than motorcycles. So that means um, such electronic uh, e-bikes uh, increase, you, you know, makes the transport convenient for riders, but it makes the traffic complex and, uh, you know, raise a lot of, uh, you know, uh, injury risks. So our observation, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> not published, so evidence shows uh, in China, the electronic shared bikes uh, is uh, are causing more and more in, uh, crashes in uh, urban <coughs> China. Uh, how do you think of you know face the increasing challenge of you know evolving riding you know mode? I, I honestly, I think that um, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier. I think I think. I think... I think once people figure out how to identify, readily identify those kinds of crashes and separate them out from just cycling crashes, that these were e-bikes or electric scooters or things like that, I think what, what people are going to see right away is that these injuries are happening all the time and that these are, these are, these are a seriously growing problem. I'm, I'm not saying it's a problem like we need to jump on it and ban them or things like that, but I think it, but, but it needs to be addressed. Um, and um, the um, e-bikes are very good for for older people. Um, uh, they're good for people who have to travel longer distances. They're they're good for people who transport things, especially if you live in a hilly area. But they do go faster than a regular bike. And if there is a crash, there's going to be more bad things happening, right? 
Um, yes. We have to figure out a way to, to protect people. Um, separation from motor vehicles is one thing, but but if but if but if if they're primarily having single crap by uh, electric bike crashes, how do you address that? I mean, we we put we could put governors on their speeds in some places they do limit it, but I'm not sure it's that hard to to remove the, the limiter on those, right? Um, I think a tip to, uh, part of this to me also goes back goes to single bicycle crashes. Like if if we don't you know, if, if, if it's things like um, mechanical failure or there was a pothole or there was like a stick in the road, um, how, do, how, do we, how do we stop those from happening? I, I don't want to get in the sense that, you know, to the old view that, that road uh, fatalities or injuries are not avoidable because I think they still are avoidable. But, 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 but these are... What, what might often be thing is the fringe of things, like these, these are actually the main things that are causing cycling crashes, right? How, how do we deal with them? I, I, I don't know. Okay, thank you very much, Jake. So uh, thank you for your great explanation to the uh, questions from the audience and from the panelists, okay. Uh, so, this is the last section. Uh, Kevin or Dinesh, do you want to say something for the, you know, the online conference? Uh, I, I guess Kavi would join me in what I'm going to say that, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all very much. Uh, I, 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 it's, uh, I've been attending safety conferences for 40 years. And, um, at no conference do people get, like Jake and other, our other contributors, get an hour to speak at no conference, even if you're a, uh, if you're a plenary speaker. And, I, and, and what really amazes me is that all of you have spent so much time uh, 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 doing what you've done for us. And as an unknown organization almost, uh, thank you very much that you, you decided to do it for us. Uh, Kavi, would you like to add anything? No, I. I mean, this uh, this session itself was so spectacular. I would. I mean, on just bicycle safety, this was the most informative session I've ever sat in, uh, and that's all our past webinars are so great, so informative. Um, I'm I'm so grateful for to all the speakers. Thank you to you, Jake and Goching, and everybody else who's not it's here. Maria, with us. Maria from. Kali, Colombia, she's done all the hard work along with her colleague, Nati, Natalia. And it wouldn't, she's hosted everything and from the background. And- uh, Hi, how are you? Thank you, Dinesh. No, thank you, Jake and Wojin. It has been a wonderful session. Uh, I, I agree with Dinesh and Kavi, but I haven't seen such a complete uh, presentation in what is something left out of the road safety focus and importance and has also pro, uh, uh, have uh, around so many uh, incidents uh, that we have to work on. And uh, thank you, uh, Dinesh, for all the effort. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Kavi, as well. We have been working very, uh, very, Lesson for this, and I am enjoyed all the session. And thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I, I think uh, I don't have anything else to say. To say, sorry. Thank um, and, and thank you and, to you, Maria. <laughs> yeah. um, and and uh, Nati. I'd like to before just before ending to point out to everyone who's still on the that you know in the last. So I'm teaching a course on road safety, which I do every year in my university in Delhi. Um, but as, as am I am doing this semester, and for the last two weeks, I've started asking my students to log on to YouTube to listen to the lectures as a compulsory part of the course. And I give them quizzes to answer after they've seen it. And I'm finding that their answers are better 
than they used to be after my classes. And so uh, I, I think it's, it, it might become a very useful teaching material. And by Monday, all the 12 sessions will be on YouTube. And I'd like to thank all our ACORC members also for their support in, in, in getting this through. And Jake and Goching, I hope uh, you can help us as we go along with what we do. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dinesh. Thank you, all audience. Uh, bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.